All right, so now we're going to be talking about vectors, um, which is how you describe the position and the, um, and the direction of different, um, different types of motion. And this is chapter two of University Physics from OpenStax. Um, so we're going to start with defining vectors. They, they are the mathematical way of giving a direction and a magnitude for something. So if you have a vector, you always have a direction and a magnitude. So an example of why you might need a vector um, is if you're talking about the displacement from where you are to another point in the world. Um, so a signpost gives you not just the, um, the direction, but the, the distance, and you need both to know how far away you are from different things. Uh, when we have a vector, we start with the tail. Um, and so where you, if you're talking about displacement, you start um, the tail of the vector starts where you start. And the arrow uh, on the other end is called the head. Um, and you draw a, a, an arrow from the tail to the head. Um, so if you are talking about the vector between Knoxville and Nashville, you s draw the tail in Knoxville and the head in <coughs> excuse me, and the head in Nashville. Um, and the vector has a, a, a direction and a length. The magnitude is the length, um, and the direction is, the arrow gives you the direction. Um, so here we're talking about a displacement vector. So in this case, you have a campground, and you are walking to a lake in, near the camp, campsite. Um, so if you want to talk about your displacement, um, you start uh, your displacement from the tent. The, um, the arrow always starts at the, um, at the tent site, and then you can, um, if you walk to the, the lake, your displacement when you get there is this arrow from A to B. The displacement doesn't depend on how you go. So you can go any particular path, and when you get there, your displacement is always the arrow that's shown. Um, sometimes we're going to draw these rough. It actually helps even when you're not working on something quantitative. If you get in the habit of drawing things roughly to scale, because it's going to give you a better, um, a better understanding of what's going on. So if you are, um, if you're going to draw a displacement of six kilometers to scale, you might, um, you might use two centimeters per kilometer, and you can actually use a ruler to get some um, rough size. Often what we're doing in physics is that we're just drawing sketches, and it really matters that it's qualitatively the right length. So you want um, six, six kilometers should be about twice as long as three kilometers. Um, at least when I'm grading, I don't go through and check students' answers with a ruler, but if you have things roughly to scale, it is going to give you information in the sketch. Um, so we're going to start the first vector that we are going to define in this, um, in this chapter is the displacement vector, um, which I actually already used. So that's the distance from, the, um, from where you started to where you are. So if you go from, um, so in the first case, you go from the tent to a resting point in between C, um, and then you, uh, and then you go to the pond. So if, when you stop at point C, your displacement vector is this green arrow shown. And when you go all the way to the pond, it's the yellow arrow. Um, but your, um, your displacement ends up as the line from A, the arrow from A to B. In case B, um, it, you go from the campsite, um, and then you realize part of the way through that you, uh, you take a rest, you go all the way there, and then you realize, oops, I forgot a tackle box, so you're going to go back, um, and you can talk about your displacement from, uh, from B to D, um, and that's going to, or actually this is the displacement from D to B, um, and you have all these different displacement vectors. No matter how you get there, your total displacement when you are from the tent when you are at the lake is the yellow arrow. Um, and this just um, works it out. So you go from A to C 
at point C, you realize you need to double back um, and get the tackle box. So um, you're going in the opposite direction, um, and that means that your displacement is A to D. And then you finish walking all the way to the lake and you end up here. You had to add a, a vector to your displacement that goes from, dis from point D to point B. And we're going to build up the mathematical language to talk about vector operations. So um, we, I showed you a little bit graphically what's going on, and now we're going to get into um, notation. So I tend to use a lot of different notations. Um, and most of the time, if you're in this class, you are, a, if you're at least in my class, you're a physics major. So I'm going to switch up notations. I try to stay consistent within one lecture, but just in case, I'm going to tell you all of the different notations. Um, you can use, uh, maybe a little bit lower, um, you can use the notation, for instance, that the displacement vector x is a, b, c, or a, x hat, plus b, y hat, plus c, z hat. Here, a, b, and c are just some constants. And this is, the A is the X coordinate, B is the Y coordinate, and C is the Z coordinate. Um, you will also see notation um, A I hat plus B J hat plus C K hat. And then sometimes instead of seeing the angled brackets, you will see curved brackets. Um, so this notation tends to be used in engineering. This is used somewhat more in physics books. This is my favorite notation because x hat, y hat, and z hat remind me what they are and I don't have to, I, I, I hat, j hat, and k hat just don't seem as intuitive to me. Um, I think the book defaults to this notation. Um, a nice thing about this is these two notations is that if you have zeros, you don't have to write the components that are zero, so it's a little bit more compact. So you can often just eliminate parts and then your expressions are shorter. Um, so, Ah, and let me say, with these, what these are is unit vectors. So this is saying go A units in the X direction, B units in the Y direction, and C units in the Z direction. So let's do a couple of examples. Here, I'm going to have that does not show up as well, so I'm going to switch colors. Um, we're going to draw our axes. Ooh, that's a nice pretty, pretty one. Um, okay, so we have x, y, and if I want to draw the vector, x is 3, 5, or 3x hat plus 5y hat. I am going to go 1, 2, 3 um, in the x direction. And I need to make my y axis just a little bit higher. 5 in y, so that's here. And I can draw a vector which is 3 long in the x direction and 5 high in the y direction. Now, a fun thing about vectors, they are a magnitude and a, and a direction, but they're not affixed to a point. So I can actually go ahead and this is the same vector and 
This is the same vector, and if I try to draw it to scale, this is the same vector. I can move it around, and it's still the same vector. Um, and that's, that's going to take you a little bit of time to get used to, but vectors give you position and direction, but they're not affixed to a point, so you can always move the vectors around. And that's helpful. We're actually going to, usually when I do physics problems, I start by drawing a picture. The picture is going to tell you what's going on. Whenever we're doing physics, we're talking about some physical process. So it's always useful. There's always some picture that you can draw. And those pictures are going to help build up your intuition for what's actually going on. Or break down your intuition, because a lot of the intuition that you have now as an intro physics student is actually wrong. So we're going to try to correct it. All right. So um, when you have these uh, so relationships between vectors, A is parallel to B if they point in the same direction. They can have different magnitudes, but they point in the same direction. So these two vectors are parallel, and these two vectors are parallel. And these two vectors are parallel. They do not have to have the same length, though they may have the same length. Um, and you can also call something anti-parallel if it is in the same, if it's in exactly the opposite direction. So the head and tail are switched. So these guys are anti-parallel to these guys. And then, um, specifically, if you have the negative of a vector, you put a negative sign in front of it, then um, that vector is, the negative of a vector is anti-parallel to itself. So, if this is A, this is negative A, and that is anti-parallel. Ah, yes, and I didn't, this, when you draw the arrow over it, um, it is, it, that indicates that something is a vector. In a textbook, you will also see that F, the A is written in boldface. When I am writing equations by hand, I can't write boldface, so I use the vector, um, I use the arrow with a line over it. And the, the fact that A is anti-parallel to negative A makes sense if we go back to our notation where um, some vector x is equal to um, x is equal to a x hat plus b y hat plus z ah yeah uh, plus c z hat because then negative x just put the negative sign out in front of everything else. So of course, they're anti-parallel because all of the components are the negative of the, um, of all of the components of negative x are the, the negative of the components of x. And if a is equal to b, then that means that they have the, the same direction and magnitude. So whatever it is, they have to have the same direction and magnitude. You can move them around. So this is also e equal to these two vectors. Um, and then if we go back to our notation, so if A is equal, here's, here's another notation I like, x, x hat plus y, y hat plus z, z hat. That means if A and B are equal, that B has to have the exact same components. All right. And then the next one we're going to talk about um, when we introduce a dot product, we're going to talk about how you tell if two vectors are perpendicular um, but or orthogonal 
They're orthogonal if they make a right angle to each other. Again, wherever they are. So if this is A and this is B, they are orthogonal. But they don't have to be lined up with any particular coordinate system. So we can draw them however we like. So we're going to get some practice in drawing all sorts of vectors. All right, so if you multiply by a scalar, so let us do this. I'm going to make some vectors up. A, vector A, we'll say is 3x hat um, plus 1y hat. If we want to my oh, and I am bleeding off of the edge. If we want to multiply by a scalar, let's let's take the example in um, from from the slides. We're going to multiply by 1.5. We're going to multiply each of those components by 1.5. So 1.5a is going to equal 4.5x hat plus 1.5y hat. So then if I go over here and I'm going to draw a coordinate system and 1, 2, 3, so A is 3 and 1. So this is A, I'm just working. So then 1.5 times A goes out to 1.5 and 4.5. So this is 1.5 times A. And that's how you multiply a vector by a scalar. Um, and you can do this with, um, so you can do it, you're multiplying each of the components by that scalar if you want to look at what happens in detail. So then we can move on to addition of two vectors. That's going to mean that you're going to add the, the similar, you're going to add the components. So if we go to... A equals, oh, you can barely see my arrow. Okay, A equals 3x hat plus y hat. V, we're just going to make um, 5y hat. And if you want to add them, you add the components. So there's no x component in V. Um, so if we add them, we get 3x hat, and then we have 1 plus 5y hat. So we have 6y hat. Now, if we want to draw what, what's going on graphically, our a was 3 and 1. So this is a, and our b was 5y hat. So if I draw B, it is like this. If I want to draw that graphically, I put them head to tail. So I go from A plus B, and then my result, I start at the tail of A, And I draw it from, uh, and I want to label my B over here. This is B. I start from the tail of A, and I draw to the head of B. And that should be 3, 1, 2, 3, in the x direction, and 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, in the y direction. So when I am adding vectors, I draw them head to tail. Okay, so 
Let's do, a, let's do a couple of examples because that's going to, this is a really important concept. One of the things about physics is that it is very cumulative. So if you get stuck on one of these things, it's important to go back and make sure that you really have it mastered because by the time that you get to the end of second semester electricity and magnetism, if you don't know vector addition, it's really going to hurt. So let's go change our vectors. Um, Instead of, let's add, let's put some negative numbers in there because everybody loves negative numbers. Um, so we're going to do negative 2 x hat and then we're going to keep our 1 y hat and let's go with 3 x hat here and minus 2 y hat. So now we add the x components, negative 2 plus 3 is 1, and we add the y components. 1 minus, well, plus a negative 2 is a minus 1 y hat. So we have x minus y hat is the resulting vector. So now let's try to draw that. And now I need to make my coordinate system have some negatives. Notice, so when I say sketch, for instance, on a homework, this is what I mean by sketch. It's good if it's roughly to scale, but I'm not going to check it with a ruler. Uh, my catchphrase is, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. Don't work harder than you have to. The point of the sketch in most of these cases is to help you understand the problem and help you see what's going on. The sketch is not some super quantitative thing. It's just to make sure that it's a sanity check. All right, so now we do, we're going to draw vector A. So vector A is negative 2. So we go 1, 2, plus y hat. This is A. And then we're going to do B. B is plus 3 x hat minus 2 y hat. I think I chose a couple funny vectors, but that's okay. All right, and now if we want to draw the sum of those two vectors, now I am going to go, I'm going to start at A and go 1, 2, 3 in the x direction and 1, 2 in the y direction. This and I forgot to label that, that's B, and this is B. A and B are at slightly different angles, but you can't quite tell from my, my picture. There's a reason I am a physicist and not an artist. All right, so there you go. This is, uh, and I think I duplicated the colors or they're very similar. This is A plus B. All right, so that's how we do addition. You can just think of subtraction as adding a negative. Um, so we'll work out a couple of examples for that too. I'm going to try to leave my coordinate system here so I don't have to redraw it. Just going to leave it a little smudged, but. I think we can live with that. It's like having a real chalkboard. It's a little bit messy. And I used to have a professor who was very proud when he ended up and the lecture with chalk all over his hands. Okay, so now we're going to define, we're going to have A equals, let's go with 2x hat. I'm sticking to x and y coordinates only here simply because that's a lot easier to work with. So A equals 2x hat minus y hat. We will say B equals mm, negative x hat. We'll just do plus y hat. 
Um, all right, and now we are going to subtract. So A minus B is equal to 2 minus a negative 1, or 3x hat, and negative 1 minus 1, so negative 2y hat. All right, so now we're going to go over here and we're going to draw those vectors. So A is 2, negative 1. So this guy is our A. And B is negative 1, positive 1. So this is B. Um, if we want to draw what it looks like, there's a few different ways you can do this. I prefer to draw a negative B. So this is negative B. And then we're going to move negative B over here. So down one in each direction. So this is a negative B. So a minus B is the same thing as A plus a negative B. So our resultant vector, and here's where my drawing is suboptimal, this is A minus B. All right, we will do another example. I think I'm going to have to redo the coordinate system because it's a little too messy over here. And let's change these numbers. Let's see. Let's go with 3, 2, and negative 5, 1. All right. Now, ooh, those are big numbers. I'm going to have to draw a big coordinate system. That's OK. We'll work with it. Um, 3 minus 5 is 8, x hat, 2 minus 1 is plus 1, y hat. Okay, so now we're going to go over here, draw our coordinate system. I need a lot of an x because I chose large numbers there. Not so much in Y. There's a little more room to work with in Y. Especially when you're getting used to this, I recommend. Right? So we need an 8 in X. Especially when you're getting used to physics problems, I would recommend working in pencil. At this point now, when I'm writing solutions, I can often write them in pen, but you're going to make mistakes, and that's OK. All right, so now we're going to draw A. A is 3, 2. Now, I want to remind you, I can move these vectors around. I just like to, for this type of problem, start at the origin because it makes it easier to see what you're drawing. OK, and then B is negative 5. 1. So this is, uh, maybe my 1 needs to be just a tiny bit higher. So this is a very bad arrow. Um, I'm going to straighten that out a bit. I'm not the best artist, but I can do better than that. Okay, and now I'm going to add them, or sorry, I'm going to subtract them. So the first thing that I have to do is I like to draw a negative B. So this is our negative B. And then I'm going to shift this up. And I have to go from here to here. So that is negative B. 
And then my resultant vector goes from the tail of A to the head of B. So that's how I do A minus B. All right, so moving along, we're going to, ah, we're going to talk about vector addition. So we're going to do a few more examples. So the way that you can, as, I, as we went through in the previous example, the way that you can do vector addition is to draw the, the arrows from head to tail. So you take A, you're going to start with A, and then if you want to do A, so this is, what's shown here is D plus A plus C plus B. Now you could actually do that in any order, but the picture here shows starting at D, going to A, C, B, and the answer is the result. And you can get that by moving these arrows around. So we can take, so I could do that in principle in any order. So I can take A plus C, and here I'm going to eyeball roughly what it is, plus B. So this is roughly C, this is roughly B, and then D goes like this, and this is the result. And you can see that when I do it that way, it's roughly parallel to the result over here. So that's how we do, graph we do vector addition graphically. Um, it's helpful when you have simple, um, simple problems like this to actually go through and do it graphically you're going to have some homework where we make you do that. So even if you're not used to, if you're more comfortable with the vector notation, you should get comfortable with the arrow notation. Uh, it builds up your intuition, um, and it will help later. OK. So here, um, ah, we also can take a vector. Um, and what I'm going to do with this one is I'm going to break it into its Cartesian coordinates and we're going to do it um, in great detail. Um, but a vector is magnitude and direction. So as soon as we have magnitude and direction, um, we have everything we, need, we know to do a vector. That said, it's not always that intuitive. Um, you're going to have to use trig, and you're going to have to get comfortable using trig. So what we're going to do here, um, if you have, um, we're going to start working with breaking vectors into their components. So let's take a test vector here, x, y, and it makes some angle theta with the x-axis. We will call, uh, you can't see my y, so we'll call this y. Um, and this is going to be a. So if A makes an angle of, um, uh, th these are, we're going to have to work out the angles a little bit here. If A makes an angle of theta with the x-axis, then the vector A, that is illegible. All right. Then the vector A is cosine theta x hat times the, ma a, the magnitude of a cosine theta x hat plus a sine theta y hat. Okay, so then if we, uh, this does not give us all of, <coughs> this does not give us <coughs> all of the angles. Um, so I'm going to make up an example. Um, we're going to say that in this case, if we call, so bear with me, my numbers might not work out to be the exact ones in this book. So this 
we'll call 45 degrees. And then this vector, which is called negative 3b. So then if that's 45 degrees and this is 45 degrees, this angle is 100 degrees and this angle is 80 degrees. Okay. So then A has a magnitude of 10 and the cosine and the sine of 45 degrees is 1 over the square root of 2. Um, so this is going to be, actually, I may just go ahead and leave this as 10 cosine 45 degrees x hat plus 10 sine 45 degrees y hat. And I'm going to leave it like that because I can't do the sine and cosine of 80 degrees in my head. So we're just going to leave it written in terms of sines and cosines. So then, now here's a tricky part. When you do vectors, uh, and I have assumed a coordinate system, I default to assuming a Cartesian coordinate system which is parallel to the page. There will be other cases that are very important when we choose a coordinate system which is not parallel, parallel to the page or which is not Cartesian. Uh, but for now, we're going to stick with Cartesian coordinate systems and parallel to the page. All right, so then if we do, if this is 80 degrees, then that's actually, and B has a magnitude of 7, so this is negative 7 cosine 80 degrees. Ah, let's, yes, because B is positive in this direction, but that means that it's negative in that direction. Let me try to write um, this would be B. <clears throat> okay, so negative cosine 80 degrees, negative 7 cosine 80 degrees minus 7 sine, uh, x hat minus sine 80 degrees y hat. So I had to put the negative sign in because I used this angle, not the angle with the x-axis, but the angle with the negative x-axis. Um, you, I don't have a good way to tell you how to do this. You could also, um, there's a lot of, there's not a recipe. So that's a difference with physics. Physics problems are not recipes that you just follow and chug through. You have to use your brain a little bit. Um, so you could have used negative uh, 100 degrees and that would give you, you could write it like this, 7 cosine negative 100 degrees x hat minus, or plus 7 sine negative 100 degrees y hat. That would also work. That would give you the same answer. Um, so then you're still using the angle relative to the x-axis. But if you use this angle, then you have to go, you have to use your knowledge uh, and go, oh, well, this is pointing in the negative x direction. So if I do cosine 80 degrees and sine 80 degrees, I get a positive number. So I need to put a negative sign out so that I have it pointing in the right direction. Um, and then, well, we don't have C. We're just going to draw a different graph, a different picture than what's on the um, and what's on the figure. Um, so then, once you have the components written out, you can add up the components the way we did on the previous slide. Or if we wanted to do A plus B, we can take A and then graphically add 
B, which is going to, which is almost parallel but not quite the way that that's drawn, but I might not quite have, I don't think I did quite the same angles as in the figure. So when you're drawing, you do head to tail to do vector addition. Um, and when you are, and that should give you the same answer as when you break things into coordinates. Um, if you're given the angles, like in this figure, it can be easier to draw them than to, um, than to work it out with coordinates. You should get the same answer both ways. So especially when you have time while the problems are still simple, I would recommend doing it both ways because then it provides some check so that you are certain that your answer is right. Um, I also want to point out, you notice that I made, ah, and here I made a, ma a slight notation mistake. This should have a hat to indicate that it is a vector. You cannot add vectors to a scalar. So that is, in fact, one of the top mistakes that students make when they are, um, when they are doing intro physics problems is that they will have on their assignment that you're adding a vector to a scalar. You are not allowed to add a vector to a scalar. Every type of quantity is going to be either a vector or a scalar. And you should know by the end of this class which quantities are vectors and which quantities are scalar. If I ask you for velocity, which is a vector, and you give me an answer, which is a scalar, your answer is definitely wrong. Now, that does not mean that if you give me a vector, it is necessarily right. But if you give me a scalar for velocity, it is wrong. Now, sometimes we ask for the velocity, and the question really means magnitude of the velocity. If that is the case, then you should ask your instructor on an exam, what exactly do you mean because the question is ambiguous? Or it's not clear, do I need a magnitude or only, or do, can I get away, or do I have to do the, um, the direction as well? Um, this is one reason why I like to grade physics problems by hand, and I always grade my own exams. Um, because I like to make sure that I understand how you guys are interpreting the problem. Um, I like to write questions where there might be multiple ways of writing the answer. So some of these online homework systems are not conducive to that. All right. Now we're going to move to the parallelogram rule, which sounds like it's something big and fancy. Don't be intimidated by it. It's really just a way of remembering how to do things. So um, if you have vector A and vector B and you want to add, add them, you can put their tails together. You draw a parallelogram, and the sum is the diagonal across that parallelogram. It's not really anything fancy. Something similar for subtraction, A to B. Now, instead of um, drawing the parallelogram, you draw, um, uh, sorry, A and negative B. You're adding A to negative B. And then you, um, it's the diagonal across the parallelogram. Sounds fancy, it's not really. Um, so here are a couple of examples where you, here's an example where you can use this. And um, I don't have the, um, yeah, we could do this a couple different ways. So you draw the, um, you have A, you want to add A and B, and so we can try to sketch these guys in here. And the sum is like that. And then so that's, that's all that you do for the parallelogram rule. Not worth memorizing. Generally, physicists do not memorize. Um, it's a useful trick if you want a shortcut while you're graphically solving problems. All right, so moving on to Cartesian coordinates. Um, and we've actually already been using Cartesian coordinates. I'm assuming that you have been introduced to these at some point in the previous class. Um, so we are going to line up, uh, we're going to call it x and y. So we have um, usually x, 
unless we have reasons to do it otherwise, X lines up along this direction, Y lines up along this direction, so uh, parallel to the vertical component, so vertical and horizontal components of the page. Um, and then because they're vectors, you know, so we can move them around. We don't have to draw them starting at the origin. Um, and it is often useful to use this coordinate system when you are drawing pictures. Um, so here, if you are doing a displacement vector, um, so you can, um, you don't have to have the origin, you can measure the displacement from B. So the vector B is going to have some displacement from the origin of the coordinates. So this is the displacement of, v, of B. So we can go here and write down the displacement of B. And if we read this graph, B is at 6 x hat plus 1.6 y hat. OK. And then we can ask about the displacement of E relative to B. Well, first we are going to find that displacement vector for point E. This is 2 x hat plus 4.5 y hat. If we want the displacement of E relative to B, then we can do X E minus X B. And a few things about notation, I want to point out the order here. Now, it's sort of arbitrary, but we stick to this convention so that when we write, no, when we write vectors, we know what we mean. The first one in this is the first one in that. And the second one is the second one. So the order of those um, matters. And then you can calculate the displacement of E from B. So we have 2.0 minus 6.0 is negative 4 x hat. And then 4.5 minus 1.6 is 2.9. So 2.9 y hat. So if you wanted to draw it on this coordinate system, you would go, this is about 4, and then 2.9 is about here. So that, ah, and I need to go negative 2.4 backwards 2.4 and up 2.9. So this would be my displacement vector E to B. And you can see that it is roughly parallel and roughly the same length as this one drawn there. That's how we do displacement vectors. All right. And yeah, so this is another, so this is showing you how you break a vector into components. Um, so that is where you have A equals the magnitude of A. Ah, and we usually, by convention, if we don't have this little arrow to show that it's a vector, over the value, the variable, that means that it is the, the magnitude. So a cosine theta x hat plus a 
sine theta y hat in terms of notation. We sometimes call this the a sub x, so the x component of a and the y component of a. And again, we might also write that ax, ay, or ax, ay, or ax, i hat plus ay, j hat. You're going to be breaking vectors into coordinates a lot this semester. Brush up on that trigonometry. Most of the time when working with intro physics students, um, when they're struggling on a problem, they're often not actually struggling on the physics part of the problem. They're often struggling on the math part of the problem, often with algebra, because you can um, get a little overconfident and think, well, I learned algebra, I learned trigonometry. I know what I'm doing, but that's actually where you're going to make the make mistakes. And you'll often be making sloppy mistakes. Um, so it's not a fundamental misunderstanding. You just get to where you're working very quickly. It, work, it pays off to work slow and methodically. All right, and we've already seen a few examples of this. The scalar components can either be positive or negative. Um, so depending on if we start the vector at the origin, if both components are positive, you move, um, you move in the positive direction um, in, along in both directions. And then they can be any combination. And if, the x, if x is negative, y is positive, it is in the second quadrant. x is um, negative and y is negative, it's in the fourth quadrant. And x is, or, let's see, x is positive, y is negative, it's in the fourth quadrant and x is negative, y is negative, it's in the third quadrant. You can, if you're comfortable with Cartesian coordinates, this will seem intuitive to you. And we have, so far, our examples have been in two dimensions because two dimensions is a lot easier to work with. Um, but of course, you have three dimensions in, um, in Cartesian sp space and you can use all of them. Um, and we will, we will use a lot of examples with three dimensions. Sometimes we flatten it and we stick to one or two because um, you guys are still learning a lot of the physics, but there's always three dimensions. We're usually talking about the objects in three dimensions and motion in three dimensions. And these get a little hairy to draw, um, but you can draw your three-dimensional coordinates. We do x, y, and z. Uh, now this is important. We always use, in physics, we always use right-handed coordinate system. In math, they don't care. They'll, you'll see both. But in physics, we always use right-handed coordinate systems. So if you line your fingers up with the x-axis, curl them towards the y-axis, your thumb should point in, to, in the direction of the z-axis, if you use your right hand. That's why it's called right-handed. Don't use your left hand. Use your right hand. x to y gives you z. Um, and if you flip the orientation as well, you're going to get all of your answers flipped by a sign. So don't do that. Okay, polar coordinates. So a good physicist is a lazy physicist. Often when we get to um, specific physics problems, uh, it's going to matter what coordinate systems you use, and you often want to choose a natural coordinate system, the one that makes it easiest to write the problem in, because that means that the math is a lot less ugly. So um, there will be a lot of times when it's useful to write things in polar coordinates. In polar coordinates, um, you have the, you're giving the angle, and we use the symbol phi. Your book use, uses the variable phi. Um, Your book uses this. Um, I will often draw phi like that because I find it easier to draw by hand. Um, so your book uses phi for polar coordinates. I might sometimes use theta, um, depending on, uh, on what I'm doing. Some books use phi and some books use theta, and it will matter when we get to um, three dimensions. So phi is the angle with the x-axis. 
R is the position, of, is, the, um, is the length of the vector from some position. So if you're talking about uh, the position vector, the displacement vector of something, then you have the x component is r cosine phi, and the y component is r sine thi phi. So I can also write that x equals r cosine phi x hat plus r sine phi y hat. Um, and then the polar coordinates would be when you give r and phi instead of the x and the y components. We won't introduce the polar coordinates unit vectors yet, but you will need them. All right. All right, so now we're going to move on to the dot product. Now, there's two different ways of multiplying vectors. Um, the first one is called a dot product, and the second one is called a cross product. Um, so we already talked about addition. Now we're going to talk about multiplication. So the dot product, graphically, the dot product of two vectors um, is going to give you the, you're taking the projection of one onto the other, um, and then you multiply the magnitudes. So if we, so here, A dotted with B is going to give you, you can, what the projection means is that you draw a 90 degree line um, from one vector. And so then, you're looking at the component of A along B. So if I try to draw this, here, the component of A along B is this right here. So this is A cosine phi. Now, um, if B has a length 1, the dot product is the projection of A onto B. Um, but in general, they do not. So if we write, um, I'm going to write different ways of writing this. A dot b is going to equal ax bx plus ay by plus az bz. So the dot product is a scalar number. We take a quantity that is a vector and we come up with a scalar. This is also going to be the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them. Um, so if B has length 1, you're just, you're left with, so that would mean that B here is 1, um, you're left with the projection of A onto B. Um, and Otherwise, so then otherwise you have to take this projection of A onto B and then multiply by the magnitude of B. Um, you can also view it the other way where it is, you take the projection of B onto A um, and then to get the dot product you're going to have to multiply by the, um, you're going to have to multiply by the magnitude of A. So, um, a few different, um, ah, a few different examples. So we're gonna let's start with a equals one x hat minus y hat, and b is equal to x hat plus 
y hat. All right, so a dotted with b is then going to equal 1 minus 1 is 0. So let me draw what those uh, vectors look like. Okay, let's draw a nice big coordinate system here. So B, A is plus one, minus one. And B is plus one, plus one. So this is B. And what you see is that these two vectors are perpendicular. So when vectors are perpendicular, the dot product is zero. And that makes sense because you're looking at the component of B along the direction of A. Well, if those two vectors are perpendicular, there is no component of B along the direction of A. Um, so this is actually a fact that you can use often. Um, if you want to, for instance, here you can see if you had a coordinate system that were perpendicular along the A and B directions, perpendicular to each other, but then they're not um, exactly Cartesian coordinates, then you have an orthogonal coordinate system. We're going to use those later, where we just draw our coordinate system at some different angle. Um, and we're going to, there will often be times where you want two vectors to be perpendicular, or, you know, you might, um, it might help with some clever tricks to solve problems if they happen to be perpendicular, so that will come up again. Let's do a couple more examples um, of dot products that are a little bit more general. Uh, so let's take a equals 3x hat minus 5y hat, b, uh, let's just go ahead and add a z hat because you're getting pretty good at this by now. Um, so we'll do negative 2x hat plus 2y hat minus 3z hat. Okay, a dotted with b is 3 times negative 2, or negative 6, plus negative 5 times 2, or negative 10, plus 1 times negative 3, or negative 3. So this dot product is negative 19. So we take two vectors. We also call this the scalar product, because two vectors, you multiply them with a, using a dot product, you get a scalar number. All right. Let's go change some numbers here. Let's see. Let's just put stuff in. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we'll make negative, positive, negative, negative positive, negative. All right. Now this dot product, negative 2 times negative 6 is 12, plus 5 times 1 is 5, plus 4 times 3 is 12, is 29. Okay, that is a dot product. sear into your brain. Two, two things to sear into your brain are, first of all, this notation, this part, a dot b is a b cosine theta. And then that if two vectors are perpendicular, the dot product is equal to zero. Because that, you know, that will be a very useful fact for later problems. All right.
The next product that we're going to introduce is the cross product. Now, the dot product is called the scalar product because it's a way of multiplying two vectors and you end up with a scalar. The cross product involves multiplying two vectors and you end up with a vector. So this is also called the vector product. This one is really not intuitive. Okay, so you take A and B and you multiply them and you end up with a vector. I'll show you the big ugly math way to get that vector, um, but we have the, the thing that you're going to use here that you're going to sear into your brain. A cross B, the magnitude of A cross B, and a little bit high. So before we had A dot B is equal to A B cosine theta. So you might be able to guess what the magnitude of A cross B is. A B sine, or sine, yeah, A B sine of the angle between them. Okay, so then it's going to be perpendicular to both of the vectors. Um, the, so whatever direction, anytime you have two vectors, you can uh, always write a vector which is perpendicular to both. So I can say vector here, vector here, that vector is perpendicular. Um, let's do this and that, and then this is perpendicular. Um, and you can, to get the direction of those two vectors, we're going to use what's called the right-hand rule. There's many different variations on this. Um, and I, I always use one. There's one where you can contort your fingers, and I always get it confused. But um, the right-hand rule that I like is line your, your palm up with A, curl your fingers in the direction of B, and your thumb points in the direction of the cross product. So if I, um, if I draw a couple of vectors here, now A, Oh, I drew A and B. Okay, so A, line my, my hand up with A, curl the, my palm in the direction of B, my thumb points in the direction of the cross product. So that's into the, into the screen for you guys. If I do B cross A, it is out of the screen. And this is another notation thing. When you are, so this vector points out of the board, so at you, and this vector points into the board, so at me. Um, and this is supposed to resemble what it looks like if you have an actual arrow. So if you have an arrow, you have the tip here, and then here you're supposed to have the feathers. The feathers are actually called fletchings. Um, fun fact, I taught archery between my first and second years, and um, in undergrad because I couldn't yet do an internship. So I actually used to do archery. Um, all right, so here's the fletchings, and then this is supposed to be what it looks like if you look down the arrow. Now, moderately inaccurate. We usually draw an X, and most arrows have three feathers, not two, but we, we draw an X. It's easier to draw an X. Okay, so if we are drawing, if we're doing A cross B, then that is going to point towards me, so you would see it as into the board. Um, I want you, while you're doing this, to get up and actually do the motions with me, because that is how you will remember what you're supposed to do. So, do it with your hand. By the way, when you're proctoring an exam, there's nothing more depressing than seeing people do the right hand rule with their left hand. Make sure you use the correct hand. Um, and as a memetic device, you can do something and something simple. You can tape three pencils together at right angles, and that's gonna, that can help you with your, um, with your homework. You just orient it. But you can't have that on the exam in most cases, so just practice doing it with the right hand. Okay, so that gives you the direction. So in this case, you do A cross B. I guess if you... Depending on how you, you know, here, if you're having trouble contorting your hand, it means you have to move your hand to be able to do it. So A cross B, 
and then it's giving you C. Um, C has to be perpendicular to both. Um, so you can do this a couple different ways. If you know the angle between A and B, you can calculate the magnitude with this formula. And then if you're doing a graphical solution, just look for something that is perpendicular to both. Um, or you can do the big, ugly, um, the big, ugly equation, which we'll get to. Oh, and also A cross B is equal to the negative of B cross A. And if you do a lot of this with your hands, so let's do A and B. A cross B is going to be towards me. So that is going, you, are get, you guys are going to see that as an X. And B cross A points at you. So you, so you see the tip of the arrow. Um, they both have the same magnitude, A, B times the sine of the angle between them, but they, they flip direction. So A cross B is equal to the negative of B cross A. All right. Now, how can you mathematically do a cross product? Bear with me here. If you guys have ever seen how you do the determinant of a matrix, this is going to look similar. So we, in fact, steal notation from matrix algebra. So we're going to say A is equal to AX, X hat plus A, Y, Y hat plus A, Z, Z hat. And we're going to do something, the exact same thing, but for B. All right. Then A cross B is equal to, we're going to put X hat, Y hat, Z hat, the first vector, A, X, A, Y, A, Z, the second vector, B, X, B, Y, B, Z, we use this sign, and then we're going to take the first row, x hat, and then this sub matrix, these four components, a, x, a, y, a, z, b, y, b, z, minus y hat, And then the submatrix that you get by eliminating the first row in the middle column. So A, X, A, Z, A, B, X, B, Z. And then the submatrix that you get by eliminating the first row in the last column. So, and it's a plus. Every time you move over one row, then you change signs. Z hat, A, X, A, Y, B, X, B, Y. Okay, so every time you move one sign, you're gonna, one row, you're gonna change signs. All right, now for each of these sub matrices to multiply this out we're going to do this one times that one minus this one times that one 
And so again, this one times that one minus this one times that one. This one times that one minus this one times that one. This is equal to x hat a y b z minus a z b y minus y hat a x b z minus a z b x and then I have to squeeze in here plus z hat a x b y minus a y b x. Okay, I want to point out a pattern here because this is how you check your work. So you, most of the problems that we're going to do in this class, you do not have to multiply out all of this stuff. There's going to be a lot of zeros. Zeros are your friends because every time you have a zero, then you are going to, you can cut terms. Um, so, oh, and I should, here, if you're thinking, well, how do you have, um, how do you have something where it's a vector here and a scalar there? You're right. That's not quite strictly speaking right. This is a mimetic. It's a way that we remember how you should be doing the, the math in here. Okay, so, x, y, z. This is in order of the alphabet. x, y, z is positive. x, z, y, you flipped two of the terms. It has a negative sign. y, x, z, you flipped a term. It's overall negative. y, z, x, it's in order, so like if you move the x around to the beginning, and it's x, y, z. So you don't have any that are flipped. Because you can do y, z, and then you start over again at x. So this one's positive because it's in alphabetical order. Z, x, y, that's in alphabetical order because you do z, and then you start over again, x, y. That's positive. Z y, x, alphabetical order switched, you have a negative sign. So you will have points where you multiply all of this out. It gets really, really ugly. You're not, I'm going to make you guys do at least one of those on the homework. But you do it once. I'm not going to have you do it on the exam because it's really just ugly and painful. I want you to go back and Look at the definition. You know, watch this part of the video again, where we walk you through it slowly, um, so that it sticks. And we'll do a couple of examples. I'm going to show you a trick. And the first time you see this, if you if you're new to cross products and matrices, this is going to be confusing. But I'm going to show it to you anyways, because you can come skip this part if you're confused now and come back to it later. Um, but for now, I, I want to introduce it to you because it's going to save you a lot of time later. There's no reason, this is called, this, what we're doing here is expanding about the first row, but you can expand about any row. So instead of doing what I just did, which is what they usually teach you, you can expand about, we'll expand about the first row. And the reason you would want to do that is because of the zeros that sometimes, if you have all these, a lot of zeros, you can, you don't have as much stuff to write. So, you're still going to get x hat, a x, or sorry, x hat, and then a y, b, y, a, z, b, z, minus a, x, y hat, z hat, 
B, Y, B, Z. Because every time I move a row or column, I change sign. Plus B, X. Y hat, Z hat, A, Y, A, Z. Okay, so now X hat, A, Y, B, Z minus A, Z, B, Y. Minus A X B Y Y hat plus A X B. Ah, I have two Y's. I did this incorrectly. A X B Y Z hat. You should always have a, an X, a Y, and a Z. Now, A X. I did this. Let me start this one over again. So, I'll just do it the way I'm doing everything else. A, X, B, Z, Y hat minus B, Y, Z hat plus B, X, A, Y, Y hat minus A, Z, Z hat. Okay, so the reason why you would do this is if AX or BX are zero, these terms just totally drop out and you don't have to multiply everything else out. You can even stop here. All right, so now we're going to do a couple of examples. And we'll go through one big, long, ugly one. And then I'll do a couple simple ones. So we're going to do the whole makeup vectors thing again. So let me erase. This and these guys. And we can do, we'll just do, I'm going to put ones and twos everywhere. Well, actually, no, let me do not ones and twos because that makes it harder to see the pattern. We'll do this. Okay, so now I have six, one, three, five, two, four. Okay, so then. I ha I'll do it the traditional way. X hat, one, four, two, three, minus Y hat, six, three, five, four, plus Z hat, six, one, five, X hat one times four minus two times three minus Y hat times six times four minus five times three plus Z hat six times two minus one times five. 4 minus 6, negative 2, x hat, 24 minus 15 is 9, but there's a negative sign, so negative 9, y hat, 12 minus 5 is 7, and it's positive, so there's a positive 7 z hat. So that's how I do the cross product. You will have some practice of these problems. Um, I am going to just change a couple of these numbers. Now I'm going to 
put a couple of big fat zeros in there and I'm going to um, let's add one more zero. You will see how quickly zeros make it easier. Okay, so now I have zero, 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 four. Six zero five four and then six zero five zero. Okay, this one's all zero 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 zero. So I have no X component. This one is Six times four is 24, and then I have a zero. And then six times zero, this one's all zeros. So this one has no X component and no Z component. That actually kind of makes sense. Remember, our cross product has to be perpendicular to both of the initial vectors. There is no Y component in either of the initial vectors but there are X and Z components. So it's gonna give us something that is entirely in the Y direction. So our final answer is that this is negative 24 Y hat. And that should be the magnitude of the two vectors. So the magnitude of A here is and this is how we know, denote the magnitude. The magnitude of A is six, and the magnitude of, well, this should have, well, the magnitude of B is gonna be the square root, I didn't talk about magnitudes, but let's do that. So this is the square root of 20. I've written this a little weird. What I'm doing for magnitude is just like what you learned when you learned, when you did, um, Trigonometry, if you have your x and your y components, the magnitude of a is the square root of ax squared plus ay squared plus az squared. Okay, so if I wanted to, well, I could take this and figure out what the angle between these two vectors is because negative 24 has to equal a b times the sine of the angle between them. I can't do that in my head. We're not going to do it. Okay, now I'm going to take this same example and I'm going to show you how much simpler it is if we expand about the middle row instead. Now you don't have to do this. You can spend all of your intro physics, and in fact, all of your physics undergrad, if you get a physics major, doing the expansions um, about the top row. It will always work. A good physicist is a lazy physicist. Always look for ways to simplify things. Okay, so. Here. I'm going to expand about this row. So this is a positive row, so this is a negative row. Six, so negative six, y hat, z hat, five, four. Uh, yep. No. y hat, z hat, zero, four. Y hat, Z hat, zero, four. Plus zero, and now I have X hat, Z hat, five, four, but this whole term is zero. And then I have zero, so I have a minus zero, 
x hat, y hat, 5, 0. But all of this has got to be 0. So I am left with negative 24y hat. Now, I'm writing out all the steps because I'm showing you how to do it. You don't have to write out all the steps. Once you get the hang of it, you go, oh, well, of course, if I expand about things rows that are 0, I only have to worry about that 6. But again, I would recommend doing it the big, long, ugly way a few times until you are very confident in doing it the ugly way. Um, you, are, you should get in the habit of writing out all the details meticulously. At first, especially if you know what you are doing, then it will, um, it will be a little bit of a pain. It's going to pay off. Um, I often see when teaching an intro class that the students who've had physics in high school start out acing it. It's really easy for them because you're covering the stuff that you've covered already but they're not getting in the habit of writing things down meticulously and they're not getting in the, they're not getting in the habit of working hard so later in the semester when we hit the stuff that you haven't seen in high school it's going to hit like a ton of bricks so you want to do things you want to get in good habits now even if you don't always need to write things out in gory detail you should so that when you get to harder problems you can. Another problem that I see in intro students is that unfortunately you guys have done a lot of automated, automatically graded homework. That's lovely. It lets us assign more homework problems, but you're not in the habit of writing things out. Um, think of your homework problems as writing an essay. You're trying to write in long form an argument to me, the instructor, instructor about why your answer is right. So you are trying to write a compelling argument. You're not just trying to get the right answer. Um, the problem with automatically graded homework it is, is that it is very answer focused. And physics problems tend to be graded in a process fo focused way. I'm going to forgive you if you make a minor sign error. An automatically graded homework system is not. But if your thought process is wrong, you won't get most of the credit. OK, so again, this is the right hand rule. Um, you can, so this is a different way of doing it. You can use a corkscrew. You turn it in the direction from A to B, and it gives you the direction of A cross B. I'm used to the right, just pick a right-hand rule, a way to remember it and stick with it. Um, here is an example that we will use later when we get to rotation. You're going to do R cross F. So here I have to line my palm up with R, and turn it in the direction of F, and that gives me the uh, R cross F, which is the direction of the torque. We haven't defined torque yet, but it's an application. Now here, I'm going to do R cross F. Notice I have to move my body and contort my body in order to get it um, to, do, to line up. Um, so I'm going to have to change the way I'm moving so that my, I can get my thumb to point in the right direction. And I want you guys to move along with the video. And when you do cross products in class, move your hand. This is a kinetic thing. Also, our bodies are hardwired to remember things better when we actually are doing them. Don't just watch, get up and do it. And this is showing the cross product, so I mentioned that the, we use a right-handed coordinate system in physics. So you're always going to, so the x-axis cross product with the y-axis gives you the z-axis. Um, should always check also when you're writing diagrams for use in your homework problems, check that you are getting the orientation correctly. Otherwise, all of your answers will be off by a sign and you don't want that. All right, and this is where we're going to stop, so I'll see you guys for the third chapter.